Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Sokol, and I am a content strategist here at Pluralsight, but I am not the reason for you to tune into today's conversation. I am joined by two truly, truly wonderful people, Carrie Harbath, who is a skills project coordinator here at Pluralsight, and Kim Brandon, who is a senior people partner for the marketing team here at Pluralsight. The only reason we are having this conversation is because they are two of the most compassionate, kind, and wonderful people I have ever had the good fortune of getting to know. And so we're going to walk through uh, an extremely traumatic experience that Carrie has gone through in her life and how she transitioned back to working at Pluralsight and all of the things that go into that. Um, I just want to give everyone at the top a kind of trigger warning, content warning for a lot of emotional and family tragedy and trauma and anything. So just want to make sure everyone is aware that's it's going to be a little bit of a heavy conversation, but the little bit that the three of us have talked, we will probably find a way to smile and laugh through some of it because that is what we do. So first off, Carrie, Kim, thank you so much for agreeing to doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to awkwardly transition and say, Carrie, do you kind of want to just give our listeners a little bit of an, of an introduction into your story and, and how it relates to what we're talking about today. And right before you do that, I do just want to let everyone know Carrie has created a uh, kind of accessibility in the workplace plural site skills course that we have available. And if you're interested in learning more about kind of ableism in the workplace, we did a whole podcast on it, which I will link in the notes of YouTube video. So I just want to put that out there. But Carrie, if you kind of want to introduce yourself and what we're all chatting about today. Awesome. Yes, thank you. And thank you for doing this. I think this is such an important topic to talk about um, anywhere, but especially in the corporate world. So I'm so grateful that we have this space and this platform to talk about it. Um, okay, so personally, so I'll go as quickly as I can through this. <laughs> uh, yeah, and here, see, already laughing, laughing through trauma. Okay, um, so... So, so for context, I started at Pluralsight back in February of 2015. So I've been here over seven years now, which is wild in Pluralsight years. That's like, I don't even know, that's like decades of work here. So been here a while. Um, and then I had been here for probably a year and a half at Pluralsight. And my husband and I had always got worked together at the same place. We were in the same career trajectory, same career paths, and we love to work together as annoying as that is. And so um, Pluralsight was such a great place to work that I was like, Aaron, you need to come work at Pluralsight too. And so uh, there was an opening on another team and he applied and he got the job and it was amazing. And so for a couple years, we were living the life. Life was good. And we were driving to work every day. We were getting our Starbucks every morning, eating our avocado toast at lunch, going to the gym upstairs. I mean, life was so basic and great. We'd watch the office after work, you know, hop, uh, hop in bed and do it all again the next day, go paddle boarding on the weekends. And that was about it. Um, and so fast forward to, uh, I was like August of 20, 2018, I wrote dates down because when life hits you hard, dates and life gets fuzzy. Um, but August of 2018, uh, we had been planning for a long time that we were ready for a baby and we found out we were pregnant. And so we were really excited. Uh, we told all of our colleagues which was basically like our family at that point <laughs> and everybody was excited with us and invested in the you know baby journey um and so again life was pretty typical you know we did the usual instagram announcement with our our fur child um everything was going just as planned and we thought we had planned as much as you can um and then at the 20 week ultrasound we found out that there were some genetic anomalies with um, our daughter Sloan and you know at an ultrasound they can really only spot physical uh, anomalies so they saw that she had a cleft lip and club feet on the ultrasound um, which sent us into a, a whole new spiral I mean at the time uh, it's hard to look back now because I have been through so much that that feels like small potatoes compared to what I've been through now <laughs> but at the time that was extremely traumatic and hard and we were sent into a whole spiral of um, new types of ultrasounds, genetic testing, 
uh, you know, I was being watched really closely. Sloan was being watched really closely until Sloan was born. So at about, uh, we found out these anomalies, but as time went on, they couldn't really diagnose anything else and said that, you know, club feet and a cleft lip were typically two of the most common genetic anomalies for babies. And so, you know, there was a high chance that Sloan um, may have just had the two most common things and that that was to be expected and that's not that rare. So we got to um, 35 weeks with Sloan and her SATs, which is like oxygen, heart rate levels, blood pressure, um, her SATs and my SATs were starting to dip pretty tremendously and they weren't looking great. Uh, and so I went on bed rest and then um, we were watching and monitoring Sloan closely. And then at 37 weeks, uh, decided to have an emergency C-section because Sloan was essentially dying. I mean, she, she her heart rate was tanking so intensely that she wasn't going to make it if we didn't have an emergency C-section. So we had an emergency C-section. Again, this was really traumatic and really hard at the time. Um, she was born, she had, you know, her bilateral cleft lip. Um, Aaron was lucid through all of this. You know, I, uh, was completely wiped out because they couldn't get me numb enough to do the C-section. And so I was on drugs and Erin was lucid and Sloan popped out and she couldn't breathe. And it was looking like she wasn't going to make it. And we weren't at a hospital that could really support Sloan. So they um, took Sloan to the NICU in the hospital and they attempted to intubate Sloan and it took about six times. Uh, the first five times weren't successful and it was looking like she wasn't going to make it. And the sixth time was successful. And um, then they decided right then and there to life flight her to the level four hospital, which is the highest level of hospital in our state, um, level four children's hospital, NICU, so that she could get the care and treatment she needed. So once she was life flighted there and I recovered, um, and again, it was an extremely traumatic experience for all of us, but at the time, especially Aaron, because he was so lucid through all of it, he was witnessing me go through the C-section and, you know, and a lot of the hardship that came with that. He had to handle a lot of the logistics around Sloan's life flight, watching her intubated. You know, there was just a lot of stress and tension there. Um, and so then Sloan was life flighted from our local hospital to the children's hospital. I recovered, we went down to the children's hospital. She spent three months there. Um, in those three months, we found out a long list of diagnoses that weren't expected. Ultimately, she's been uh, clinically diagnosed with CHARGE syndrome, which is a, Typically, it's marked by an adjustment in what's called the CHG7 gene, but that hasn't been found in Sloan. They're actually doing studies that show that they're, they think there's another genetic marker they haven't found yet for charge, um, and they think that Sloan might be one of those cases. Um, it happens to one in 10,000 people, so it's um, not the most uncommon, but it's not common either. And Sloan's most profound disability diagnosis is deaf blindness for life. And she's profoundly, profoundly deaf blind with little to no treatment. So, you know, cochlear implants uh, will not work for Sloan. Um, she cannot see that we can tell yet. And uh, with all of that, she's amazing. And, you know, we can get there. And I talk about that a little bit in my course. And we've also talked about that in our uh, podcast, but, um, but at the time, while we were in the NICU and we were receiving these diagnoses, among other health diagnoses, Sloan now has a tracheostomy, she had a G-tube, she was receiving tube feeds. We came home at, from the NICU and our home looked like a hospital. I mean, it was just like going from one hospital to another. It was not your Instagram baby labor with matching robes and blankets and cuteness. <laughs> it was, we went home and next thing you know, home health rolls in and they're rolling oxygen tanks down our driveway, right through the door and, you know, and had um, all kinds of supplies, not just oxygen, but we were suddenly sticking, you know, like window planes up to mark. We have a medically complex human in our house. So if there's an emergency, you make sure she's okay first, things like that. Um, at the time through all of this, Sloan's birth, you know, as it was so traumatic, my mom and Aaron were like, I mean, they were just amazing. Aaron was an amazing father, which will make me tear up. So here we are. <laughs> um, and my mom was an amazing mom. And so, okay, this probably tells you where this is going already. <laughs> we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, they were amazing. They were amazing. And my mom was so dedicated. 
She was there every day. We spent probably eight hours a day together in the NICU. NICU mom would show up every single morning at 7 a.m. and she would sneak through our door, even if we weren't awake yet, with McDonald's for Aaron and I and coffee for Aaron and I from our local coffee shop. And she would wait for us to get up so she could snuggle Sloan before she went to work at Home Depot. Uh, and so mom was just the best grandma and the best mom. And she dove right into all of Sloan's diagnoses and what Sloan needed. And, um, and it was amazing. So we get through Sloan's birth and we're just starting to sort of pick up the pieces and get to rolling. And then in September of 2019, uh, Sloan caught um, just RSV, which for, you know, most kids, I mean, you, it can be rough on babies for sure, no matter what. But for Sloan, it was very intensely life-threatening. So we ended up back in at Primary Children's in the um, intensive care unit with Sloan. We were there for a week and uh, my parents had a day where they were able to be with Sloan and Aaron and I caught RSV as well. So we weren't allowed to go. So my parents took you know, good care of Sloan. They were there with her. Um, and then they... Uh, they spent the day loving her. They, you know, worked through rounds with the doctors. And then the next day, um, my, I received a call from my dad that my mom wasn't doing well. I had talked to her that morning and, um, I had ended up back down at the hospital with Sloan to just check on her and see, you know, how she was doing. And I was feeling better and, uh, was actually in the middle of a work call when I got a text from my dad that they had called an ambulance on mom and that she, um, was uh that they she wasn't doing well um and so i went to find aaron at the hospital we left and that day later that day my mom passed away uh unexpectedly so she had aspirated in her sleep um and due to a diabetic spike that had gone sort of undiagnosed and that was completely unexpected. And it was really hard after everything we had been through. And she was one of our pillars of support. And this was just six months after everything we had gone through with Sloan. Mm -hmm. So this was September of 2019. And I remember at that time, Aaron, uh, my husband, had immediately messaged his boss and my boss and just said, hey, we, you know, Carrie's mom just died. And everybody was so supportive and in tune to Sloan's birth and what had just gone on in our life, that they knew how invested and involved and amazing my mom was. I mean, they knew of our relationship before, but just what, what an amazing grandma she was too. Mm -hmm. And so um, we ended up, you know, we were just automatically given time off and everybody covered for us. And it was like, just go and don't think about work for, it was like a month or two months. And then we came back about two months later. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to nine months from that point, and we're just starting to move through the grief, you know, of my mom, um, navigate that. In between that time, when was it? When did the pandemic hit? What was that? Uh, March 13th of 2020. Wow, that was good. That You have it down to the day. I don't know why I remember that, but yeah. I remember being, it was my, my previous job. I was, it was the last day we were in the office and everyone's like, see you on Monday. And then yeah. never oh, went back. Yeah. Never went back. Never went back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the pandemic hit. Uh, so, you know, we're moving through grief after my mom and, and it was just like devastating and I, I mean, I, we were in the place where we're like, we can't pick up the pieces from this. Like, how do we keep going? Um, but we did. Then the pandemic hits and Aaron and I are navigating life with Sloan, grief from mom, you know, trauma from Sloan's birth. Um, Aaron had some childhood trauma. He was navigating. The pandemic was getting scarier and scarier. You know, we were living in a world where it felt like not only was the pandemic getting scarier, but it was becoming politicized in a way and Sloan being disabled and so high risk, it felt like we were part of a, a community that was disregarded mm -hmm. and that her life maybe didn't matter as many as others did. And so it, it was really starting to become a world where our mental health was declining pretty quickly, especially after mom had passed. So both Aaron and I had been in uh, intensive therapies. You know, we were working on our own mental health. And this is where I'll give a really specific trigger warning. I'm about to talk about suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and so nine months after mom died, so September, 2019, Aaron, who was my partner, is where 
here I go again, but mm-hmm. partner of 13 years. Uh, we met in high school, planned for baby Sloan, had the most amazing partnership, amazing life. He was the best. Um, he took his own life on June. See, and I can't even remember the dates, June 3rd. <laughs> see, like, it's wild to me. Mm-hmm. This is wild that I, it's like your brain gets so fuzzy after things happen. But June 3rd, 2020, uh, it was completely unexpected. I mean, as it is yeah. with suicide. And um, for me, this sent me into a world where I thought, you know, my, I mean, I, I thought for many weeks and even months after that, I thought my life was also over. Like I, I was sure I would die of heartbreak and that sounds so extreme, but there were, there were times where I was sure my, my life was done too. Mm -hmm. So that's the story of the trauma. Um, And then there's one other piece, which is in November of 2020, which was five months after Aaron died, Sloan caught COVID, ended up in the ICU again and almost died Mm -hmm. and then we made it out of that somehow and Sloan's still here and she's kicking ass and her Sloan MO we're still going yeah so so we I guess if you guys listen to the the podcast Karen I did we we talk all about Sloan the toddler and then all sorts of stuff about Sloan but obviously you know what we're gonna focus on now is sort of how you manage I I always talk about in my own life like human beings can adjust to it's in, it's incredible our power to kind of adapt to things and you are yeah. like a shining example of the fact that you are here and everything that you do on your own Instagram page and everything that you do for plural site everything is just like I I know I'm making you feel uncomfortable right now like throwing yep. compliments on top of you but I apologize <laughs> But like you, you know. are a sh- <laughs> you're a shining example of this and so what I what I would love to kind of Kim I'll let them bring you into the conversation about this is like when something like this happens and I know obviously like to say something like this happens is impossible to there's things like Carrie's life it doesn't happen like this but like what are some of the things that goes through kind of your mind or like a human resources people ops type of a situation like it's almost like we talked about like we want to talk about preparing for the unpreparable like what are some of the things that you know if there's any human resources people watching like how does one plan for a thing like this like what can you do to at all ease the transition that Carrie had to even like start to think about how to be a, a, a working person beyond all of this yeah Um, so to answer your question, I don't know that you can plan for it. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely was nowhere prepared. Um, and I started a plural site in July of 2019. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I started, I started, um, as the, you know, people business partner for marketing, um, and really took some time to try and get to know the team. And I had heard about Aaron, right. And I'd heard Aaron's amazing and, his wife works here as well. And, and so I had been, I, we weren't a very remote friendly company at that time. So, you know, I had been explained, this is why Aaron's working remotely. It's for them to be able to take care of their family and, and be able to manage um, Sloan plus their workload. But every time I heard anything about Aaron, it was always so positive. And you could tell people really, really cared about Aaron and Carrie. Um, and I remember finding out, um, there was a team member here who, um, very much cared for both Carrie and Aaron. And she shared with me, I went into a meeting right after she had found out about Carrie's mom and she was just so upset. And I was like, what is wrong? You know, and she shared like the, um, Carrie's mom had passed and how hard that was for Carrie and, um, for Aaron and how shocking, quite honestly, it was. Um, and so I kind of knew pieces of this story, although I never had the fortunate opportunity to meet Aaron, um, but I knew a lot about Aaron. Um, and then fast forward, <clears throat> I, I don't know if it was a phone call or a Slack or how I found out about it, 
Um, but I was made aware that Aaron had passed away. And, um, and I just remembered already connecting and I hadn't met Carrie either. Um, actually up to this day, I don't know that Carrie and I have actually met I know. in person. <laughs> you know, we've talked about it so many times yeah, what yeah. happened due to COVID and everything else. So, but I kind of felt like I knew them. I knew enough about them that I felt connected to them. Um, and so getting this message that Aaron had passed away and we didn't have any details, um, I really just kind of was like, oh my gosh, right? Like, what do we do next? And so I definitely was not prepared as a human resource professional on what to do. And I remember even panicking a little bit that morning and that morning and I was sitting in my office, which was my bedroom because of COVID and just thinking like, how do we, like, what are the next steps and, and what do we do? Um, and I feel really fortunate to be on this podcast with both you and Carrie. And I kind of feel like I'm here to represent a lot of people because it was not um, an individual effort. Um, we actually immediately, Carrie's supervisor, um, got together the people who kind of were impacted or needed to know in an effort to support Aaron and his team and Carrie and her team. So there was like this whole um, group of people who really truly were just, this is what's happened. We don't have more information, um, and but I wanna bring everybody in. Literally by the end of the day, you know, Carrie is very, she's one of the most open, transparent, willing to share people. Um, and nobody really knew what happened, but we knew it was very unexpected. And then she shared an Instagram post that people shared with us saying, look, Carrie has shared this. Um, so we then knew a little bit about the circumstances. We knew that, that Aaron had um, died by suicide, um, which then really just hit me even harder because even though I hadn't met Carrie, it was like, oh my gosh, how do I help and support this individual? Um, and so again, not prepared. I remember calling my leader and like, what do I do? And she was like, I don't know. I've never been in this situation either. And, um, but it really became this group effort of people who truly cared about both of them. Um, and, you know, there were, I really looked at my role and we kind of defined because Carrie had a business partner. Aaron had a business partner. I was Aaron's. We did not, you know, one of the things we wanted to do early on was minimize the number of people that Carrie had to interact with just to simplify it, right? Um, and so it was like, okay, who do we want to kind of handle all this? Um, and I said, I will, I will take it. I will be the one to kind of, to manage this. And then it was also an immediate connection to, benefits and looking at Aaron's information and trying to see what was all there. And um, so that I was prepared. And I think that's, I was prepared when I went to first communicate with Carrie. Um, one, it wasn't anything that had to be taken care of that day. So, you know, I knew I didn't have to speak to Carrie about all these kind of technical aspects that happen. Um, when you have a team member who passes away. Um, and so I think one of the tips I have to prepare for the unpreparable um, is to slow down and really think about, like I really thought about what are the critical things that I need to talk to Carrie about? What homework or late work can I do before I even reach out to Carrie? Like, you know, making sure um, that there was a component of, understanding like the beneficiaries on Aaron's forms on, you know, what was she, what benefits did Aaron have for, you know, what surviving benefits did Aaron have in this situation and really pulled in benefits, pulled in, you know, all those people to understand that before I ever reached out to Carrie, um, because I did not want to add more stress to Carrie. I wanted it to be very organized, very streamlined, um, and very clear on, on where we were at with, with all that technical stuff. Um, and because Carrie made a really interesting comment when she was talking, which when she said, you know, we, we shared with my team members that we were expecting and really they're like family. You know, she said it was like sharing with family. And thinking about that, 
And just listening to kind of Carrie as she went on, one thing that's hit me even just through this podcast um, as we've been talking is one of the things you have to do to prepare is you have to build a culture where people matter because you can't turn that on when trauma hits. If we didn't have that culture where Carrie and Aaron were truly family for the people here at Pluralsight, the response would have been vastly different. So that's one key. You have to have a genuine culture where people matter and where colleagues are more than colleagues and um, that you care about each other as humans. Um, and I think that was probably key in everything I've just talked about and everybody coming together. I mean, literally senior leaders up to our CEO were involved on how can we help? What can we do? Um, keep us in the loop. We want to be aware, right? Um, and then I just remember thinking, how do I, how do I approach Carrie? You know, I knew she had to be heartbroken, devastated, you know, in the depths of grief that I don't know that I, I know I don't understand um, at this point in my life. And, and I hope I don't, I hope most people don't ever understand the depths of, of trauma and grief that carries in, you know, that's, but I, I understood enough that it was, um, that I didn't want to add to it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to really try and support. And I didn't expect to get super emotional, but I cared about Carrie, even though I had never met her. Mm -hmm. And I cared about the situation. Um, and so I, I remember trying to be really thoughtful about how do I reach out to her? How do I let her know that we need to cover this stuff, but also see her as a human? And I do remember putting a lot of thought into it, but I also never felt like I did anything really like that would have me sitting on a podcast talking about, you know, how I handled the situation. Um, and I think my first step was just really to reach out to Carrie via email and say, like acknowledging that Aaron, you know, I never met him, but what I heard about him, you know, that he was an amazing person and, and people here speak so highly of him and love him and really just wanted to acknowledge that loss. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I think I, you know, said, look, there's things we need to cover, but please reach out to me when you're ready to discuss this. And I sent that maybe a couple of days after Aaron passed away to really try and um, to give her time to just, I don't know, like come up for air, you know? It's, so it's something, you know, I, there's this uh, sociologist who's done a couple of things here site with me since I started her name is Dr. Tracy Brower. And the, the reason that I discovered her was back in the fall she wrote a piece for Forbes titled empathy is the most important leadership quality. And one of the things about plural site that I have realized in my, you know, eight months here, nine months, however long it's been is we really do have this incredible culture and people listening in might say like, Oh, well, it's great that you were all able to rally around Carrie's story, but like, what about, different types of companies, like how do they build this type of culture? And the, the thing that I think of in my short amount of time here is that empathy being a leadership quality. Like, I think one of the reasons that people rally around each other at Pluralsight so much is it really does come from the top, like all the way up our CEO, Aaron Skynard is wonderful, but like he isn't as connected to all of us as like our leaders might be because simply because he, he can't be, he's the you know, CEO of a global company. But I think of the you know, my direct manager all the way up through, you know, our senior vice president of brand and everyone in between and like, and, you know, Kim being our kind of people ops person for marketing, like the leadership at our team is so empathetic and cares so much and just like checks in like just last night as we we're recording our senior vice president of brand who oversees, I don't know, 200 people, Adam, Adam Gunn, I'll give him a shout out. We all love Adam. He sent me a Slack message last night. And he was just like, hey man, we haven't talked in a while. Can we just like grab 30 minutes to chat? And that's rare, but it's a thing that any leader can do. And it, it, it to say like, it kind of, it's infectious. It makes all of us want to care a little bit more. And I think as like an action item, like, yes, it, empathy is something that people may have inherently, but you can also learn it. You can kind of focus on if you're a person who maybe doesn't 
always see other people's emotions. Like that doesn't make you a bad person. It's just something that you can like make a note or if, if you're a leader in, in your meetings, like just end the meeting by being like, Hey, how are, how's everything going? As one of the check-in, this has nothing to do with work. You know, those are things that make other people want to be more involved in each other's relationships and each other's lives. This isn't really a question, just yeah, I, I think it's something that it, it is infectious. Yes. If you don't mind, I have a couple quick thoughts on that. Absolutely. And I'll keep them quick. It won't be my usual novel. <laughs> no, um, you're, you're good. But uh, so everything, I mean, Kim said was just beautiful. And I, um, so I want to say something about when she had, so the, the first conversation she had with me, I mean, I remember that was in the throes of like, you know, they're just, they're, people talk about how there's like a graph. If you Google it, there's the graph of grief, for example, and there's no like trajectory of grief, right? It's, it's like grief is like, maybe all of a sudden you feel like you're doing good. And then it's just a spider web because you'll hit a point. And then for example, this is a basic one. I'll be at Starbucks and I'll hear Aaron's Starbucks order. And then I run out of Starbucks crying because I'm like, well, mm -hmm. that was the worst. And then I, I'm sh thrown off for four days. And so grief is, is can't be, um, planned for, or there's no trajectory. It's just, it's just a journey. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I, but I was, but there's a period where it's, there's, um, an intense period of grief, no matter what, after somebody dies. And, uh, and so with Aaron, I was in the throes of that when I talked to Kim and I just remember, um, you know, because Aaron was an employee at Plural Site too, and we, had sort of, I mean, the joke was, which, and I mean this in the most like, so almost, um, yeah, jokey way <laughs> that we, people would be like, oh, the power couple, Carrie and Aaron, and we joke about it, whatever. And so the thought of going back to work without Aaron in the picture was like, this is uh, terrible. This is mortifying. This is sad. I can't do it. You know, like, like, plural sight is my identity and so is Aaron and so you know everything my identity was just crushed mm -hmm. and so when I talked to Kim I remember one of the initial things we talked about was which is a question that has to be asked it, you know it's it's like Kim mentioned one of those critical things that we we need to discuss right at first is like what do we kind of think in terms of timeline you know like when I might come back which does initially feel ridiculous probably on both ends mine and kids <laughs> of like this is a ridiculous question but we have to tackle it right now um and I remember at the time I was like well if I don't die before I come back uh maybe you know at the time I was like I'm never coming back internally that's how I felt uh but externally I think I I don't know I can't even remember what I said but I just remember thinking like whatever I say is going to be laughed at and they're going to think this person like this is ridiculous mm -hmm. And I think I said, I don't know, a year, six months, and I gave some ridiculous number. But when Kim, when I said that, I just remember Kim had empathy for that. Mm -hmm. And she was like, okay, we will take this and we will look and see what we can do or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't laughed at, you know, everybody understood how painful it was and that the concept of going back was nearly impossible for me. And so just the empathy for that was was truly amazing. And already, while I still wasn't even thinking about work, thankfully, um, it already sort of began that journey of like, oh, maybe I will be okay facing these people and going back again. You know, like it already began that, uh, that cycle for me. And then there was one other example, which is when I came back, my identity was still crushed. And I remember as a professional, I felt like I had nothing to add. I mean, I just for a long time felt like as I walked anywhere, I was viewed as like the sad widowed mom, motherless mom to a disabled kid. Mm -hmm. And that, and in a very condescending way by everyone else. And I, I whether that was self-inflicted or I felt that from others. And so I remember when I, I came back and started and uh, my leader said to me, I was expressing some self-doubt on a call and he would listen as I would cry <laughs> and he was just wonderful, which will make me cry right now. Great. Because it's just, <laughs> he, he would probably watch this and be like, oh, there she goes again. <laughs> um, but he expressed to me, he listened to me and listened and we had talked about all the hard life stuff. And so we had, you know, been really personal for a long time. So it wasn't like this was um, out of left field or, you know, unwelcome. 
And then he said to me, well, he, he was like, you have a lot to offer the team and the company and you, you have a lot of expertise. And he reassured me that I was welcome on the team and wanted on the team and that I had a lot to offer, whether it was then or six months from then. And, um, and it made, it reminded me that yes, like I was once a professional <laughs> and mm-hmm. even though all of this crap had happened to me and I didn't feel that, that identity anymore, that maybe I could find that again at some point and that he would be there to help me find that when I was ready mm-hmm. and, and that he wanted to lean on my expertise as a professional when I was ready again. And, and it was so validating to be seen as like not the sad widowed mom to a disabled kid without a living mother anymore, but to be seen as like a professional at a tech company. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. And so though, I think those are two really good instances of having empathy in professional moments that I think were just, are just so necessary in coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Adam, one thing too, to add that I, excuse me, that you mentioned was empathy can be learned, right? Um, and I got permission to share this. I was um, having dinner with a coworker last week and um, and she mentioned that she actually lost both of her parents during COVID within 10 days of each other. And she was in a different country, couldn't go, couldn't be there. And she talked about how one of her team members just showed up like at her place, in the middle of COVID and just like every day just showed up. Mm -hmm. Um, And she also talked about her leader and her leader saying, I've never experienced loss. I, you know, but I really want to do what I can to help you. Um, And that leader was very open to getting coaching Mm -hmm. and guidance from her coworker who was there. And she said, I know it wasn't like natural for him but he, it really meant so much to her that he cared enough to be like, I need help in this and was open to that coaching and that guidance on how do I really support someone in a traumatic situation? Um, and so if you're, you know, I think that ties to the self-awareness. If you're not really sure what to do in a situation, find someone who can help because even just being open to that is a huge step and a a great leadership quality to say, look, I don't know everything. And this is an area that's tough for me. How do, how can I navigate this in a way that shows I really do care about this person and supports them and helps them the best I can. So I loved how you said it can be learned and just wanting to learn that is huge. Yes. There there was speaking of, of podcast, it, there was a, a podcast that I was listening to with Michael Lewis, who's a very well-known author and uh, has written a number of books like Moneyball and all these different things that he's very well-known. He had a tragedy where um, his daughter passed away like a, in a car accident. And um, exactly what he said about just like showing up, like he had a, a friend who lived near him. And like the day they heard, they found out his friend just showed up at his front doorstep and his friend was like, I don't know what to say or what to do, but I'm not going away. He's like, I'm going to sit on your porch. And if you need me, I will be here. And he was there. And it, that's like, the person was admitting, like, I don't know how to be empathetic, but I'm going to be here and I'm going to figure it out. And and I do think that's something that as an action item for any, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be human resources or people ops, like it can be a marketer like me it could be anybody can learn how to do those types of things but but I do think it it is something that is infectious if if your leaders are that way and um something else we want to make sure we touch on especially because we have you here Kim is like obviously everything that happened in this situation is unique and impossibly hard to deal with and like you said everyone kind of rallied around Carrie and how what were the best ways that you could ease her burden, but what are some things, because I want to make sure we have like takeaways for anyone listening who might not be in HR, like 
what are some things that everyone needs to be doing as just a, a worker? I come from an insurance background, as we talked about in a lifetime ago. So I'm very keen on some of these things. But what are some action items that people listening in can do just so they are prepared if God forbid something were to happen? Yeah, no, Adam, I love that because it, it actually kind of sets up some thoughts that I had going just during that conversation. Um, and a lot of people actually looked to me and to Pluralsight and said, like, you know, can Pluralsight set up a GoFundMe? Can Pluralsight? And as hard as it was, like, you have to be able to balance, you know, can we do that? Can, you know, does Pluralsight sponsor a GoFundMe? And I had to tell people, like, some people, like, look, Plural site can't do that, but then finding a balance, <clears throat> excuse me, finding a balance on, but we were like, okay, we're not going to sponsor the GoFundMe, but you are more than welcome to use our channels to make sure people are aware of it. Um, and so it took so many people to get the response and to be a part of supporting Carrie and Aaron. Um, we had a team member who put together the GoFundMe, um, you know, and the HR person, I was like, make sure Carrie's okay with this. Make sure Carrie signed up on this, that, you know, we aren't, you know, broadcasting grief where she's like, look, I just want my privacy. I don't want this, you know? So for the HR person, make sure that you're, that whatever's happening is, is in a line with what the individual wants. Um, but then we had people who organized a food um, schedule, you know, and they gave us very specifics on like, these are things that they can use. And somebody can take groceries in and other people can take meals in. Um, and it also, but that was done by a team member. Um, and people just did not stop and wait for people to do things. They jumped in, you know, someone else was like, I know Carrie and Aaron have a really beautiful yard. That's a lot of maintenance. Um, <clears throat> so we had two individuals who stepped up and just said, look, we'll take on organizing um, yard care. And, um, and they did it for a while. And then when we realized we probably needed even ongoing support, they threw that open for other people. So, um, but that was all done as, as people who cared about them. It wasn't done on behalf of Pluralsight or, you know, Pluralsight was not directing it. It was the people in Pluralsight who just refused to sit back and do nothing. Um, and then it gave opportunity for so many people. Like, I know I really was like, what else can I do? You know, and Carrie has a public Instagram account for Sloan. And I learned about them and I learned about, you know, kind of looked through that. And, and, um, and I really, you know, you just care. And so as an individual, not even as a human resource or a people, a people partner, it was honestly like, now what can I do as a human to help? And so I was like, oh, good, I can sign up for some food. Oh, I can, you know, do some of these things. And um, and I do think it's so, and I find myself in this situation where it's so hard to say, you know, to know what to do. So we often say, let us know what you need. Um, and I fall into that so many times. And I was so grateful for team members who didn't ask. It was just like, look, we know they're going to need this. We know they're going to need that. They stepped up, they took action and they made it easy for everyone to kind of participate and rally um, around Carrie and Sloan and, and her sister and her dad, you know, it was, and so it was, it was a team effort on so many levels to, to get the response um, that I'm really grateful that they had. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad. Yeah, go ahead, Carrie. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add on to um, Kim's point about uh, she made a really good point about how sometimes people, when something hard happens, will say, let us know what you need. Um, and I just want to add to that, that like the way I had, I had in other communities, other than plural site, still to this day, I get people that are like, well, how's your plural site group? Because of how everybody showed up. And everybody outside of Plural Site saw, and, and this goes back to work culture, that everybody saw the response that didn't require me, somebody who had no clue what I needed. All I knew is that I, well, and all I knew is I needed to keep Sloan alive at the time. That was really my focus. But like, I, other than that, 
I had no clue when people would come to say to me and say, what do you need? I was like, I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need. This is, I can't even, my brain didn't work. It still doesn't work most of the time. And so to have people step up like they did to Kim's point and say like, this is what you need. And even if you don't need it, here it is, you know, like it was, it, it was so, so helpful and supportive. And I look back at that time and that's something that if I ever do write a book or, you know, produce my own content of some kind, I'm like, I, there's so much that I could personally write about that came from Pluralsight and, you know, the um, community here that they did so intentionally that I think so many could learn from. Um, and I still, to this day, get people that are like, how do I get a job at Pluralsight? Because not, you know, because Pluralsight's awesome, but also because if something really hard happens to me, I know I'm not going to be alone. And I mean, you definitely want to be that company that, that exists in all multitudes and layers of life, not just because you have a cool pool table and, you know, you have like seltzer waters and that's it, you know? So, yeah. We do have and a just, pool table for the record. One other thing to add to that, I remember, um, jumping into the the document they had for people to sign up for groceries and food. And I remember really wanting to be able to meet the need and to get them what they wanted and needed, right? Because you go grocery shopping and everybody is so different. And it seems silly, but I remember reaching out to the person who organized this and saying like, can you tell me exactly what they need? Like I, I wanted that list. So I knew what to do. And and then finally, like, no, you know, they were like, here's some high level things. And I finally, I was just like, I'm, I'm probably going to get some wrong. I'm going to buy things that they probably don't want, but I just, am going to go do it. And I, and so that kind of talks like often we, we don't take action because we don't know exactly, you know, we are, what do you need? I'll do what you need. Um, and I just, you know, empathize with that feeling. Cause I remember just even on buying groceries thinking, oh my gosh, what if I get the wrong things? And um, and, and really trying to meet the need because I wanted to support. And sometimes you just have to meet the need and it may not be exactly what they're looking for. They may have gotten different items from different people. Um, but you know what items showed up and that tells you, even if they're not the right items, items showed up and it tells you people care, mm -hmm. right? The people are willing to do whatever they can. So don't let that lack of um, exact knowledge and detail stop you from just taking some sort of action. Mm -hmm. um, I, one thing I, I want to touch on, uh, I, as I mentioned, like I a lifetime ago sold financial products and, and life insurance. And it's something where it was at my, my dad's agency. And he, I used to hear him tell people when he was selling them life insurance, like, I know this is an impossible thing to think about, but if something were to happen to you and he would always use himself, he'd be like, if I got hit by a bus yesterday, and I'm like, great example, dad. But he would always say like, if that happened to me, he's like, everyone, every institution is going to come asking for money. It's like the one place that's going to hand me a check. And by me, I mean, my, you know, wife and family to take care of all this stuff is this insurance man, provided that you have everything set up right. And so I, the way that I always think about human resources and people ops is like, people tend to think of human resources and it's like a running joke in different, you know, TV shows and movies like, oh, they're the, like, you only talk to, to human resources if you're in trouble. Like, I think about it the exact opposite. Like, I think of, especially like Kim, you and like our entire team's like, you guys do all these things that we don't see that make our lives awesome. And like, I just love it so much. And there's always unforeseen things, but there are things that every employee can do to just make sure everything is in order, whether it's like you mentioned, you know, updating your beneficiaries, or if you have a 401k, like making sure that goes to the right person. So like, are there some of those, like, just like important things that employees might not be thinking about that, you know, they need to make sure, even if it's like, if you have health insurance, like confirming every year that your children and your spouse is covered under, like, what are some of those things that employees can do? Adam, this is so critically important. Um, and um, Carrie gave me permission to talk about this, but when I first started looking in um, to Aaron's situation, he didn't have beneficiaries listed on anything. 
And, um, and then I look to see like, do they have the document, like their marriage certificate? Cause Carrie uses a different last name, you know, her and Aaron had different last names. So there was a bit of panic for a moment because we had switched um, human resource software. Um, and it was like, I couldn't find a marriage certificate. And I was like, oh my gosh, like he doesn't have anyone listed. And if they're not legally married, cause I didn't know, right. Um, and they were legally married, which then made it easier because if you don't have people listed, it will often go, depending on the state, depending on the laws, depending on, you know, I don't want to make this a blanket, blanket statement. Um, but in our situation, everything did default to the spouse, which was Carrie. But I looked into all of that before I ever got on the phone with Carrie. Um, but it does. And I will tell you, being in human resources for what am I like over 15 years now, um, I've seen a lot of situations where people don't have things in order. They don't change a beneficiary when they get divorced. Um, and I have seen, not at plural site, thank goodness, but at previous companies where we have had to pay life insurance to um, an ex-spouse and the individual is married again and that his, you know, his or her current family does not get that because the legal document still had it to an old beneficiary. Um, so I also saw really devastating situations. You don't ever want to think about losing a child. Most companies will have a child life insurance, and it's usually very minimal, like a couple bucks a month is what most people pay for a child life insurance. Um, and I had, I had a coworker in my previous company, and, she, and she said, no, I don't want to think about that. I feel like if I sign up, I'm, you know, jinxing something. And I was like, how can you not like, and I saw situations where tragedy hit and they lost a child. And then not only are they dealing with that grief, but now they also have the financial burden of dealing with that grief, right? Um, and so really trying to take a step back from the emotion of it when you're not in the throes of it um, and make sure your stuff is in order. Make sure you have beneficiaries listed and understand what you need beneficiaries listed on. You need it on the life insurance your company provides, on your 401k, um, on you know equity, if you have equity, um, on any of those benefits. And if you don't know, ask. Ask your people business partner, ask your people ops. Um, and usually you can verify that very easily by going into whatever HR platform your company uses and you can go and, and verify your beneficiaries and you can usually update it um, very easily on the website. The only, the only, you know, there's a couple where if you're married and you're not flagging your spouse as the beneficiary that it takes a little more and some, you know, um, some documents notarized. But for the most part, you can update all of that from your laptop that you work on every single day. And I know a lot of people are like, no, I don't wanna think about that. But I promise you, if you take the time to prepare for that, it makes that time frame so much easier on those who survive because it doesn't add additional financial pressure or legal having to go to the courts and prove that you're the legal, you know, part of whoever receives their, their estate. Um, so definitely doing that. Um, that's a huge thing. And people forget about it all the time. Yeah, I just to add to that, and Kim, it might have been you that said this, so I can't remember, but um, somebody recently said the greatest gift you can give your family is making sure you have your estate in order. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I never thought I would be in this position. Um, I can guarantee Aaron never thought I would be in this position. Mom, my mom never thought that we would all be in this position. And so I think that. Uh, you know, that through that experience, I have learned that the great, that is the greatest gift is that you can make sure you have your state in order. And, and to that point, once um, I sort of cognitively came out of that initial visceral grief moment, that was the first thing I did. I met with somebody, got my estate in order and made sure everything was set because I know how 
um, you know, you can't plan for the unexpected. And so, yeah. So I think that's really important. Yeah. It's like, you know, when tragedy happens, it feels like the entire world is falling down around you. Like the last thing you want to have to do is have people coming to you being like, well, you also have to pay for the world falling all around you. Like, yeah, you want to make sure that's taken care of. And there are a lot of people that come to you and say, Hey, can you, we have the fanciest possible things for you to pay for when Mm -hmm. the world is falling apart around you or the fanciest possible things for your family members who have died or, you know, there's those, there are businesses that capitalize on that. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it is really important to make sure it's all in order and you know what you want and what you need and it's planned for. Yeah. And I think taking it even a step further than just what can you plan for and make sure your beneficiaries at work are up to date. Also letting people know what you want um, and being really clear about what your desires are um, so that they know, right? They know how you, they would, you would want all this handled. Um, and and it, just to kind of reiterate, it is the greatest gift. I remember I was in my early 20s, so it was a while ago, <clears throat> you know, over 20 years ago. Um, and my parents sitting us down and saying, look, you know, I'm the youngest of seven kids and really outlining everything they had done. And I had like a reaction to it. And I was like, I don't like this. I don't like talking about this. I don't want to hear about this. You know, I don't want, you know, I just didn't want to even think about my parents passing away. Well, fast forward literally 30 years. And, um, I lost my dad in March. He was 93 married to my mom for 67 years. I mean, had an amazing life. Um, and everything was so smooth because they had done everything he had picked out. I mean, we, we didn't question what he wanted or what, you know, my mom wanted for him. We as children could just step in and help because they had made it so clear. Um, and it really allowed us to focus on each other and supporting each other and grieving um, and knowing that we were doing what my dad would want in that situation. And so um, even outside of work, right? Beneficiaries, yes, that's a work thing, but really letting people know, you know, what your, your wishes are. Um, it sounds, I know some people want to avoid it, but it really is a gift to those, those people who survive. Yeah, that, you know, 90 minutes of uncomfort, of discomfort to go through all those things and make sure everything you have is in order is going to save your loved ones just in a mountain of stress and on top of everything else that they're experiencing. And and so I feel like that's, you know, I, I, I could talk to you two for four hours, but I, I feel like, you know, as like takeaways, people like we wanted to have this conversation and yes it, I'm sure everyone listening was like wow I can't we Carrie and I have joked and she's joked all the time about like if you want to hear about Sloan and the uh, hero baby as you know people like to call it like it, you, you can listen to the podcast that we did and like all the other times Carrie has talked about it and like in, in reality like Carrie's daughter is a toddler that's like and like that's what it is and like I'm sure everyone hearing Carrie's story is probably like what a hero is like the, Carrie didn't want to do these things didn't want to experience this life, but we yeah. wanted to tell the story so that people could like really understand the importance of all these different things that you can do as an employee and all of the, the ways that you can step up and care and, and be there for your, your teams through empathy and things like that. And so that was why, you know, you'll, you'll notice if you're familiar with portal site, like we didn't talk about any products or anything that we didn't want to, we just wanted to, to share this story. And so I, I like, I'm going to let you two like, give any closing thoughts you have, but I just want to like to say thank you to both of you. Like I've gotten to know you both over the past few months because of this and a bunch of other things. And I feel extremely fortunate and I feel inside, I instantly felt a part of this portal site community, but I don't know if either of you two have any parting words before we go, but I will let you floor is yours. So I want Carrie to have kind of the last word <laughs> because this so much is her, her story. Um, but the one thing I really want to hit on before we close is, you know, Carrie's story is powerful and it's, a, it's compounded trauma, right? Um, there's so many things that just built on each other, but I also just want to throw out the caution that so many of our team members are dealing with trauma, with, 
you know, things happening in personal life. And I, you know, worked for years where it was like, leave home at, at home and work is at work. And the reality is we're humans and we're complex and we can't do that. What's happening in our personal lives impacts our work. What's happening at work impacts our personal lives. Um, and so just a, just a word, I don't, it's not even advice, but just be aware of your team members, be aware your leader may be going through it. Um, so especially if somebody kind of changes how they're showing up, dig a little bit, what, you know, what's happening? How can I support you? Because while we knew, and, and this, and Carrie was very transparent and very open, not everyone is going to be like that. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't need our support and they don't need the compassion and the empathy at work. Um, and so really just, and it, it goes back to that culture where you really care about your people, whether you're a leader, whether you're a team member, um, it doesn't, you don't have to be a leader to care about people. So many people who stepped up in Carrie's situation were not, were not leaders. They were just people who cared, team members. Um, and so don't let, don't wait for big traumas to happen. Trauma can be very unseen, very small, um, and, and make sure that we're really looking and taking care of all of our team members. Um, so I think that's probably one of my, my biggest pieces of advice, um, and, and that you cannot prepare for that. You can't turn on compassion and empathy when something happens. You have to have that relationship, because otherwise it comes off very phony. And people see right through that. So you need to be genuine. And that is a culture that you build every single day in how you show up and how you interact with people. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's probably my biggest thing is look for the small things too. And when people change their behavior, there's usually why. So, you know, express some empathy, create an atmosphere and a culture where they can speak up. And they may not want anyone else to know about it and respect that, but then how can you support them in a way that um, really lets them know that you care? All right, you're up, Carrie. Bring us home. No pressure. Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> I love what Kim said. I think that's amazing. And I agree that um, that's something that through this whole experience, I obviously I am very public about a lot of these experiences, and it probably comes from the compounded nature of the way things happened. Um, it, it was by default that things just sort of became so public. It was like I suddenly had no choice in what was happening in my life and it just happened at me and here we are, we're public now. Um, but you're right that there is a lot of, of private wow. things that happen to people that people want to be kept private. And there's this concept of like, and in grief and just I think um, hard experiences in general, there's, there's like the grief circle and, and people, my friend, dear friend Darian talks about it frequently, but there's people sort of on the outer edges that are affected, but maybe not as intensely. And then as you hone into the, to the center of the circle, that would be maybe me in the case of Aaron, who's the most affected. And you um, aim to follow the lead of the person that is the center of that circle, whether it's a hard moment, it's, you know, uh, grief, uh, trauma, whatever it might be. And so, Kim, I love everything you said. Um, and then I just have a couple of things. I will notes. Be yes. Before you end, Carrie, can I just add something to that circle? Yes, yes. The circle the of circle. grief. Yeah. Because this is this is another point I really wanted to to shout out to what I think Plural Sight did right, um, and kind of a tip for other professionals, um, human resource professionals, and leaders. Um, Carrie was definitely at that circle of the grief. Um, but there were a lot of people in the circle that were also impacted. Aaron's team members were significantly impacted. They cared. They loved Aaron. Um, I know people on Ter Carrie's team. And so we we also really, you know, looked outside the box. And part of it was um, Aaron's leader saying, the team needs something. We need to be able to do something for the team. We cannot just act like okay, let's divvy out the work and just continue working. So we partnered with our um, benefits provider and they actually had, as part of our benefits, somebody who came in and did grief work with the team as a team. 
And so, you know, grief is not a laser where it just hits a couple people. It has that ripple effect. Yes. And think about who else is this impacting and how do we also support and take care of them in this situation and think outside the box. Um, think, you know, partner with people. Cause I, I just went to our benefits team and I was like, look, do we have anything? What can we do here to really support this team? And, and they found a resource that we had available. So partner with other people, but recognize that ripple and that outside of the circle. And remember you have to take care of them too. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Love that. Totally agree. I, um, and out that kind of leads me into my, my things here that I wrote down because trauma brain, I guess. Um, so I, uh, you know, one thing I've thought about a lot that I've always been so amazed by, especially at plural site. And, you know, I know Aaron, which will make me tear up. So here we go. Uh, probably because Kim so said so many great things too. So that also, I've been holding it back this whole time, Kim. So thank you for that. <laughs> but, um, you know, Aaron's the, the, Aaron's death and loss was also very complex because it is suicide. And unfortunately, mental health uh, issues aren't as widely understood and accepted as they should be in the world today, you know, and there's uh, not a lot of, it's getting better. It is getting significantly better, but the, we still lack a lot of education and empathy around that. And so, you know, as I listen to Kim talk through, you know, this, like today, um, and talk about how the team responded and how people viewed not just me, but when she talks about how people viewed Aaron, and that is what gets me. Um, and when I look back, you know, and see the response to a great example is actually the person who named the GoFundMe. They didn't name it like a GoFundMe for Carrie. This is this was something that stood out to me right from the beginning. It was in honor of Aaron, and. And these are the things that still to this day get me because, you know, I see the complexity that Aaron experienced and the mental health aspect of it. And people love him dearly. And like how Kim spoke of him today, you know, it all goes back to empathy and having empathy for your coworkers, supporting your coworkers in their life journeys, their experiences. And, um, you know, I'm just really grateful for where I landed professionally that allowed me that support when Aaron died. Because I know uh, actually from experience and hearing other people's stories that that isn't the case and not everybody is empathetic to a loss by suicide. And so I'm, I am really grateful for that um, and how people still speak of Aaron at Plural Sight today. People still share stories with me about Aaron. They make Aaron jokes, which I love. You know, they, uh, they talk about him all the time, how he would love what Sloan's doing today. It's just beautiful. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and then the other piece that I want to share, and, uh, and I think both of you touched on this too, is that, you know, in the tech world specifically, like, I think there is, there's kind of just like a base level of privilege that kind of exists in the tech world. Uh, and I think sometimes that also um, coexists with this, this feeling like we're, we become immune to hard experiences. Um, we're immune to life's heavy stuff. And I know I felt that, you know, back in 2017, Carrie, when I was paddleboarding and getting my avocado toast every day, I was like, this is great. And my life is good. I'm never going to have anything hard happen to me. And then you forward, fast forward four years later and it, wait, is it four years later? I don't know, but here I am. <laughs> and, um, and so none of us, unfortunately are immune to hard stuff. And to Kim's point, you know, the human experience is complex. Humans are complex. Um, and so again, it goes back to finding that balance of empathy for one another, supporting each other as humans and more than just like a number or a professional that's going to get a job done, but really seeing each other for what we are and what we need. And at the end of the day, when you look at it from like a corporate lens, you know, I mean, that is ultimately what's going to create and foster a great culture and a great work environment that's going to end up creating some kick-ass product because the culture and the people are, you know, um, connecting with one another so deeply and feel so comfortable 
and close, you know, close to one another, supported by one another, that they can be open and aren't afraid to fail both personally and professionally and are connected in that way. And so I think that, um, yeah, so those are kind of my thoughts as existential and ranty and wild as they might be. So, and thank you. Thank you both. I, I'm really, you know, this is what my, I feel like my life's thing is about now is just, I facing the hard stuff. And so I'm so grateful that we have this space and Kim, I'm, I am so grateful for everything you shared today. This is just awesome information that I think everybody could benefit from. So, and thank you, Adam, for hosting this. This is great. Of course, I, I can't thank both of you enough for being willing to do this. And I just, you know, we've talked a lot about, we just think it's very important. So uh, for everyone who who's tuned in, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, and, and thank you all for joining us today. And again, we'll be sure to put all of these different links and helpful things in the, in the notes at the bottom. So uh, thank you, everybody. But again, most importantly, Kim, Carrie, thank you both. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.